Yes, it's that time again where Gary comes to share a few thoughts and ideas with our listeners, with our congregation and any others who may have chosen to tune in. And this is a talk for Sunday, the 28th of June, which marks the 26th Sunday of the year, the 180th day of the year. So almost sort of bang on the middle of the year, if we can believe that or not. The year has certainly passed by quite rapidly. And I think because our focus has been so preoccupied with the coronavirus and all the implications of that. Not least of all, the way in which the COVID environment and circumstances have made life unpredictable. It just occurred to me over the last day or two that we are working with so many variables at this time in our lives that it's so difficult to make decisions, to pin anything down, because the variables are many and, and they are changing day, day after day. And so I think many of us are just wishing for a time when things would normalize in the sense that there are less variables, that life is more predictable, and, and that would certainly, for many of us, give us far better peace of mind and may indeed help our mental health status. And so having said that, we are in a situation now as church where government has now decreed that churches may open for services of worship from the 4th of July. And that is under certain conditions. We as Droitbridge Methodist Church leaders have to say, and, and some might be concerned to hear this or not happy to hear this, but that we aren't in a situation where we can rush out and say, well, come the first Sunday after the 4th of July, we will be open as usual for business as usual. Sadly, this isn't the case and isn't going to be the case. And there's some very valid reasons why we can't be looking at offering public worship from the 12th of July. Some of these reasons are that we are having to complete some very detailed risk assessments as regards the use of our premises for worship. And those risk assessments can't take place overnight. They are very thorough. They have to, have to be worked through very carefully to such an extent and to achieve the place where we can say to the Methodist Church of Britain that we are able to accommodate people for worship with a very low risk factor involved. So we need to be able to assure ourselves and the Methodist Church that we can offer public worship with very low levels of risk attachment. We have to COVID-proof the circumstances around Sunday services or any other gatherings on our premises, and that is not an overnight job. Secondly, having said that, and, and we are aware, some of us, that our Methodist Conference is meeting this weekend, we are having to wait for guidelines from the Methodist Church as to how we go about opening for worship, the, the various criteria that we will need to have to fulfill. Um, and, and so we, we haven't yet had that. And, and the Methodist Church have said that we need to wait until after conference to hear anything further in this regard. So in a sense, we have to await the Methodist Church's domestication of the government announcement. There are many other factors. One or two further, just to say, as we are probably also aware, or we can reason with if we think it through, many of our stewards, many of those who provide the infra infrastructure for Sunday worship, the stewards and those on duty doing various other chores that happen behind the scenes, many of those of our people are in the higher risk category. And we are not expecting any of those folk to feel that they have to in any way place themselves at additional risk in serving the church in such ways. And so we are aware of that factor, of our stewards maybe being a bit more 
careful and reluctant of rushing forward to say, here I am, um, let's open, I will be on the door, or I will be in the vestry, or I will be serving tea or coffee. Um, we will have to go carefully at seeing how we can resource our services. And then maybe finally, just to mention, we're also very aware that we're heading into the season of summer holidays. And so a lot of people will be away or hoping to go away, maybe less available to attend services. And so that's another aspect that we're factoring into our decision making. Can I just say, and again, not to alarm anyone, but at this stage, our leadership team are suggesting to church council that in wisdom and with wisdom and consideration of all factors, that we need to be working steadily and carefully and optimistically towards the situation of being able to launch services again from September, the beginning of the new church and school year. Having said that, we are not against and in fact would be hoping to find ways that we could gather our people um, for social get-togethers or in other ways of conducting a worship service um, before the beginning of September. Of course, what we are looking at would be ways in which we could meet outside our buildings. If we think of the lovely uh, grass car park that we have. Now that it's summer, it's dried up and it's nice and green. And we're trying to think of ways that we could meet outside, which lowers the risk, and in low-risk ways, and in ways that don't involve having to deep clean buildings, etc., after having met inside. And so the thoughts are maybe we could have a service or two outside, people gathering in family groups um, as one idea. The other one that could even be easier to organize and which we think would meet the deep need of people getting together as church in socially distanced ways and safe ways would be, for example, to have tea gatherings in the garden or in the car park area as well on the lawn where we might gather by a pastoral group where a pastoral visitor may invite his or her group to gather for afternoon tea. We could each bring our own refreshments we would have the chairs social distanced and, and we would be able to meet together in fellowship as church community. So that is another idea that we're looking at. I've still got to talk to Maureen, our pastoral secretary, about that. That's a new thought in our, in our minds and something we hope that could offer a meaningful way of getting together as church family. So those are just one or two things as regards how we could be church in the near future. Another thought that is upon my mind, and another feeling, I suppose, that I experience from time to time, is that of the bit of fear, uncertainty, maybe a better word is anxiety, when looking at coming out of lockdown, albeit progressively, and, and albeit not at a level to begin with, not going in at the deep end, we'll be starting slowly. But a bit of anxiety of how are things going to be when we start venturing out of our homes again and start going about our ordinary business, our normal business, start working again, start school again, whatever it might be, whatever it is that normally occupies us, how is it going to be? And so if you're anything like me, there's a bit of anxiety attached to getting back to however much of the old normal we will experience. And, and, and that's a real and valid experience to think of further change. For many of us, it was change going into lockdown. For all of us, it was change, and not all of us do change well. And coming out of lockdown will be another experience of change. And with change comes anxiety. And, and don't feel alone in that. Many of us will have that kind of experience, some anxiety attached to that change. And then moving on to another line of thought, and I might link back with that of the experience of anxiety. And one of the set readings for this week is the story of Abraham and, the, and his sacrificing of Isaac. And some of us will know that story well. Others, like myself, I have to reread it again to remember some of the detail. 
But Abraham, the father of faith, the patriarch of the monotheistic faiths of the Middle East, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that great father figure of faith understands in his mind and in his, and in his heart that his God, the God who called him to pack up his things in, the, in a distant land and to travel to a promised land, which would be a place that God would lead him to, no exact destination in mind, that great father of faith understands that his God is calling him to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac, his one and only son by his wife Sarah, by his wife Sarah that is. We know he had an, a son through his um, slave, the slave woman um, as well, Hagar, but his only one legitimate son, so to speak, in old terminology, God, he thinks God is calling him to lay his son Isaac down as a living sacrifice, and in fact to slay his son Isaac to God as this living sacrifice to God. And so Abraham sets off on the journey early the one morning. He's told his son Isaac that they're going on this mission. Isaac obviously doesn't know who the, who will be the sacrifice, who the sacrifice will be that God will provide, that Abraham says God will provide. And off they set, they climb the mountain, they get to the top of the mountain. Abraham builds the altar and even as he's building, um, Isaac is expressing concern, you know, where will the sacrifi sacrificial animal come from? Abraham assures him that God will provide the sacrifice. And towards the end of this incident, we, we read in the narrative that Abraham then ties Isaac down onto the top of this fire altar and is about to... to sacrifice Isaac, killing him with his dagger. And at the last moment, the angel of the Lord appears and shouts out to Abraham to, to halt, to stop, not to go ahead. And just in the nick of time, and as Abraham looks up, he sees a ram caught in, in a bush, and he is so relieved. Who can imagine his relief? And he sees that God has provided an alternative sacrifice. God has delivered him from having to sacrifice his one and only son. How do we ever get our heads around that story? I mean, there's the brilliant and amazing aspect of that story of Abraham's faithful obedience to God. Whom of us could imagine ourselves being able to go through with sacrificing any of our children to God, least alone our only child? How many of us would be able to, to say, okay, God, I will, I will do that for you? I mean, it's, it's just beyond our comprehension. And so if we think of Abraham and his primitive humanity, there may be a bit of us and a bit of a part of us which can, can revere Abraham for his absolute blind faith. And that is all very well. On the other hand, there is a part of us and there's a very large part of me that cannot begin to condone or understand that Abraham could have gone to that length to have lifted the knife, so, so to speak, and to be in the act of lowering it to stab his son to death, that he could go, have gone that far. I mean, it's, it's barbaric. It's, it's mind-blowing. How could Abraham have ever gone to those lengths of apparent obedience to God? Let alone, how could our God ever have asked or told Abraham to do this? How could God ever expect this of anyone to kill their child, to sacrifice their child as a living sacrifice to God? And in fact, as some people have, 
of our contemporary times would think. How could God even have asked the, the children of Israel to have sacrificed innocent animals as sacrificial offerings to God? Even that may sound too much and that God is going too far. Recently in the news, there was the story of a man of Asian descent who killed, who murdered his daughter in what we would call an honor killing. I think the story was something to the effect that his daughter had chosen not to marry the man who had been chosen by the local society, by her family, for her to marry. And she went off with the man she loved. As a result of that, she was captured. She was laid on the altar, tied down, I would imagine, to some, in some, by some means. Her father took his sword or equivalent weapon and he chopped off his daughter's head. His daughter was of the age of something around about 18 or 21 years of age. Abraham's belief system, his understanding of God, allowed him to believe that God, the God of Jesus Christ, had called him to offer his son Isaac as an offering. And he was about to chop her, his head off. Perhaps not chop his head off, but he was about to do the same. He was about to take Isaac's life because of his belief system and his understanding of God. Would that act of Abraham's be much different to the act of the Asian man here in the 21st century who took his daughter's life because she contravened their culture, their custom, and maybe even his religious beliefs, his understanding of what God asked of him as a man and of his children. I struggle deeply with that Abraham narrative, and I have not yet found a way of being able to reconcile the scripture, the story, the narrative at, at its literary face value with the Christ of our scriptures and the Christ of our faith. I ask myself the question, would the God of Jesus Christ ask of us to offer our children, any of our children, as a living sacrifice to God? Would God ask any human being to slay any of their children as an indication of their allegiance to God and as a statement of their absolute obedience to God? I suggest not. I am unable to reconcile such a request by God with the love of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. They are irreconcilable to me. And certainly I would find it very difficult to offer my life in service and in, fa in, and in faithful worship of such a God. The only way I can get my head around that narrative and integrate it into my own Christian philosophy and Christian framework is to think that Abraham was a product of his time and his environment. There are many suggestions and, and the indications that in his time and thereabouts it was not unusual for God or gods to ask for human beings to offer up their firstborn as a living sacrifice, as an indication or statement of their allegiance to that God, of their absolute subservience to their God. And so I would like to think like the only way I can include that narrative in my Christian experience is to understand that Abraham was a product of his environment and what he thought was God asking him to do it was his faith framework, was his understanding of God that allowed God to ask such a thing of him. I would venture to say that religion, 
faith, even our Christian faith, is evolutionary by nature. It is a faith that is forming in its, in its concepts, in its substance. As time progresses, it develops, it changes in some of our core values. And certainly where we stand in the 21st century now, if any Christian had to come and say, Gary, John, Sheila, Cheryl, Jane, I believe that God is asking me to sacrifice my child as an indication of my absolute subservience to God and obedience and faith in God, we would tend to say, my dear young man or old man, just hold it there. I cannot agree with you. I cannot believe that this is what the God of Christ would ever ask any one, any human being to do. Please hold it there. Let's just check this through before you go any further. And so that Abraham's story is an interesting one for me. What does it offer us that we can take away with us then, you might say, and I might well ask? I think it offers a few things. I think it does offer us that gift of faith of Abraham's, yes, not to go to the extent he went, but we do see something about his faithfulness that I think we can take something from. We can, be, we can learn to, be, to become more a people of faith in our own lives, a person of faith. We can be, learn to be more faithful. We can, we can be challenged to exercise our faith, to make our faith stronger. And certainly in this time, as we come out of lockdown, as we venture out again into the streets and, and back to work, and, and as we allow our lives to assume some of the old norm normal, we needn't be afraid, but we can trust that God has gone before us and God ventures ahead of us out of lockdown and that God will take the steps ahead of us as we go back into some of our normal and for some of us as we venture into new territory as Abraham was doing heading for the promised land. God goes ahead of us and the faith of Abraham can strengthen our faith and, and be an encouragement to us showing us that God is faithful and God will lead us um, ahead, going a step ahead of us in this journey. I think the other thing of the Isaac story, what it shows us, is that God does provide a way out. Not that I ever believe that God led Abraham to, to place Isaac on the, on the sacrificial altar in the first place, but God intervenes and says, hey, hold it, Abraham. This isn't actually what I want of you of you. Here is a ram. Here is a way through this dead end. I'm sure everything within you, Abraham, is resisting going through with this. And I'm providing a way out. You might feel you've hit a dead end, that there's no way out of these circumstances. And God provides a way out through the sacrificial ram. And friends, as we might sometimes think we're hitting a brick wall, we don't know the way through this, Coming out of lockdown, we might think, gee, I, I'm a bit anxious. I don't know how I'm going to get through this wall. It feels that this wall is insurmountable to me, that I'm going to be, there's going to be too much asked of me. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I want to suggest to you, as I do to myself today, that we serve a God who is a God who, who provides a way for us. He provides a way for us in Christ he shows that he provided a way for Abraham in providing a substitute in the ram. We serve a God who has no dead ends, but a God who always makes a way. And God makes a way for those who, who place their faith in God. We serve a God of new beginning, a God who in fact majors in new beginnings who delights in new beginnings, in creating new pathways of life and opportunity for God's creation and for the likes of you and me. So I want to encourage you as we continue through uh, and with this COVID time, as we continue to a, a, a different level of lockdown, 
but within which we can experience some a bit more of what was normal to us. Fear not, fear not, for God is with you. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Jesus Christ is with us. He goes ahead of us, she goes ahead of us, providing a way. And God just asks us to hold on to our faith and to believe that our faith is enough. For we shall walk not by sight, but by faith. And so may God bless you, God keep you in this time for the week ahead until um, we chat again and until before then and after then. May God forever hold you in the palm of God's hand. God bless. Go with God. Bye-bye.